And we're just ditched. my shot here. Okay, we're all set. Tom, let's talk a little bit about the evolution of your research uh, from the time you came into uh, the university system in the late 40s up through the current day. I I'm kind of interested to see how it's evolved from area to area. Well, I've already covered the earlier part of IIT, right? Yeah, but I'm just talking about Madison. Yeah, okay. Well, I came here, I told you We that talked about two of the students, you know, Swenson <coughs> and yeah. uh, Ben Blauto. But as I told you, I had large numbers of graduate students, masters and doctor's degrees, and these two were the, among the earliest that stick in my mind had distinguished careers eventually. There were others, too. For example, Don Pierre who got, did his Ph.D. with me in the 60s, I suppose, or maybe uh, the early 60s or maybe the late 50s. He'd come from the University of Illinois where, he was a grad, where he'd done his undergraduate work. He had relatives, I think, up in uh, the Door County area, this heavily settled Belgians up there. He's a Belgian bank up here. <clears throat> and after he got his degree here, he joined the Department of Electrical Engineering at Montana State University at Bozeman and rose through the ranks, became full professor, then chairman of the department for a number of years. He's now chairman of the department at the present time. He was the one, that I suppose, out there, knowing, you know, that got maybe the first grants in the Department of Electrical Engineering granted, um, you know, from NSF and all that kind of thing. He's written several, a couple books. Uh, he's been active in the American Automatic Control Council and uh, one way or the other. He's also active in, uh, 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 well, as it's called now, IEEE, relative to automatic control. And he's worked on committees and things like that, so he's a pretty well-known figure. Real nice fellow, too, okay? I've been fortunate. Grand student had a lot of really nice guys. And, well, that's one. We want enough for another one. Well, he, was he near the beginning of your control? Well, I've been in the 50s. I think he got his degree in the early 50s. So he was near the front end of your yeah, research area. Yeah, he's been up research there. You know, he's now research probably in control. the 60s up there. So if you figure back, it's 30 years ago or something of that nature. So 35. I guess the the guy that uh, is maybe would be most prominent now is Vidya Sager. Yeah, well, as I told you yesterday, his father, if I recall correctly, and here it was, came from India. He received an academic appointment in the Canadian University System, Mathematics, if I recall correctly. Well, I don't want to say this because it just occurs to me that, uh, although I told you Alberta, it occurred to me that uh, right out was Alberta, maybe I got to do it. Anyway, he came down for one of those Canadian universities, like the Saskatchewan, for example with a master's degree, and he wanted to do a PhD thesis. So he did a PhD thesis with me, and he's a very brilliant fellow. You can see that from his very earliest times. Because I think when he, he he came, he was only something like 18 years of age. Uh, and he had a master's degree. Yeah, yeah, he didn't do his master's with me that I recall. It's possible he did, but anyway, he did a PhD for sure. And he was finished fairly early, at 22 or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Then subsequently he went from here, he was two years, if I remember correctly, at Marquette. Then he returned to Canada and he was a professor starting at uh, Sir George Williams University, which changed his name subsequently, and is now Concordia University. And after some years there, he published a lot of papers and so on. Um, he then joined the faculty at uh, University of Waterloo, which is sort of a premier, I'm told, premier one among the premier universities in the state system in, or national system in uh, Canada. And to my knowledge, uh, he's still a member of the faculty there, or at the present time he's in India for a couple of years doing some kind of a program development there for him. But he's also been a visiting professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley, worked with the Sores, I recall, out there, and the two of them published a jointly written book. And Vidya Sagar has published several books under, uh, under his own name. So he's had a distinguished career. And he's really a bright guy, real bright. Well, Who else from the control area sticks in your mind that came through here? Well, we could have uh, reviewed the whole list. That's something to overlook because I have a list of all of the PhDs invested <laughs> in the more directly on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, we'll just look for the ones that stick out. Yeah, well, so the, the, I've mentioned four of them that, and five of them uh, that stick it, but there's Tiedemann in here who did his PhD thesis in control. There's Jim Stiles, an outstanding uh, graduate student. Uh, I had both a master's and a master's, to, or a master's and a PhD with him. He stayed on our faculty and is internationally, I think, really known for his work subsequently in energy area, public uh, utility associated. Uh, he's one, and we've had other people uh, stay on our faculty that I directed their thesis. Professor Marlow did his PhD thesis in control about 1963 with me and is now uh, been assistant and associate professor on our faculty and here and received a number of teaching awards. And he's traveled uh, in uh, Pakistan, in uh, Singapore, in Indonesia, where we've had uh, a work with colleges of uh, engineering there relative to the installation of computer systems in recent years. And he's the one that's gone there and led the program and, uh, you know, install the equivalent of mainframe computers into a, either their, what you might call a college system or their university system, more so than just the department, you know. And he's a man that really knows computers. Uh, at his present time, he occupies, uh, well, uh, teaches and directs a course that's based on the lab that's project-oriented and usually has an enrollment of the 20s or 30s. Actually, this semester he told me at 40, very popular course, uh, of, uh, uh, that's, that's control-oriented, and they do projects. But he also teaches our basic courses, our, the basic course occasionally, or he'll teach uh, a second level course and so on. So he's had a, quite a good career. But I think of Dick, when you think of computers, the guy that can fix them if needed, that's Marlow. Not many can do that, you know. As you look at, uh, at the uh, field of control, um, can you pick out a few of the really important figures and maybe review what what the essential uh, content of their work was? Yeah, I, I can do that, but uh, while I was still thinking of people that I did have that had careers, you know, names are trickling in my mind, there's Professor Duffy's son, mm -hmm. Neil Duffy. And I mentioned Professor Duffy because he's famous for his work, recently retired from the Department of chemical engineer, I guess, for his work on solar energy and so on, okay? And his son, Neil, who at the current time is a professor, of, uh, associate professor probably in mechanical engineering, uh, took three graduate courses from me, as I recall a number. And then Professor Bollinger, who's the dean of engineering at the present time, took three graduate courses from me. And, and those two men are prime figures in the control work being conducted in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and they're joint authors of uh, this a recently published book on relative to digital computer control, essentially, in here. So there's a couple that have had their careers right here. But thinking otherwise, <clears throat> yeah, I, we discussed yesterday five individuals that I thought, because of their published research, their publications and all that, and although some of them I've known personally or casually in one way or the other, a couple, some of them I've never met because I simply haven't met them. They're reformers, okay? And, uh, you know, I mentioned the Japanese, Saul Rocky, who's had a very distinguished career. He's now dead. He died several years ago. But if you look up his books, you look up his published papers and so on, I thought he was one of the premier people in the academic world that uh, engaged academic-wise in the development of automatic control. Once again, primarily theory, probably more so than in uh, laboratory. Then another one of those was, because uh, he's dead, was the fellow I told you from uh, Hungary, because Budapest is in Hungary, right? So he was the Technological Institute there. Saki, as I pronounce it, probably C-S-A-K-I with kind of a little wiggle over one of those, however you pronounce it, but I always said Saki and let it go with it, uh, who's, writ who's written a half a dozen books, and these books are monsters, six, seven, eight hundred pages in here, and I suppose he first wrote them in whatever language he teaches in there, obviously, 
And then they were subsequently, maybe not every one of them, but a number of them were translated into English, into German, into Russian, into French, and so on, okay? And in addition to those books, he published many papers. He was very active, I suppose, in the earlier days of IFAC and the European side of it anyway. And he wrote many, many uh, papers. And I think he died in his early 60s, it would be my guess, maybe because of overwork <laughs> when you do that kind of thing. Okay, well, you could name another one, like uh, in Russia. Uh, Professor Soledovnikov, <clears throat> who's probably not very well known to most professors that teach automatic control in this country, whose oh, maybe definitive work was the writing of a four-page, uh, four-volume work summarizing all of automatic control theory, but... Uh, thing that I particularly liked is four volumes, which translated from the Russian into German, and I had a seller by engineering library and read it when they came, was that uh, an excellent book on uh, statistic, what's called statistical control theory. And actually, I think there's now an English edition, as I remember those four works we got to. Yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> he's not too well known. Because unless you read his books, how would you know about him or read Russian magazines or so on, you see? But of course, the one in Russia who a great many people know because of the nature of his work and the fact that he's traveled abroad a lot, been in the United States at IFAC meetings uh, held here and was a visiting professor. For example, Kenny, I think, arranged it at the uh, at University of Minnesota some years ago. Is Professor Sipkin, who's at the Institute for Automatic Control of the USSR Academy of Sciences in Moscow. That's roughly his address. I always have to look up the street number each time I write him, unless I look at an old envelope or something. And he's written, I don't know, maybe all together, at least a half a dozen books and maybe more, okay, that have been translated into German and into English and into French and otherwise. published many papers, speaks very good English, and uh, I'm told I never met him personally. But he was at the meeting uh, just recently held in uh, Chicago, came over for that. And my former student, Islami, I mentioned to you, okay, uh, chatted with him, talked with him there, gave him a ride to the airport in his car. Islami has said that he's transmitted, transported many prominent European control theorists in his car to airports or train stations in the course of attending various meetings and so on. He's single and can do it. Okay? So, you know, but Sipkin's book uh, on uh, sample data control theory was published, I think, about 1963 and uh, been translated in English. It's available. Yeah, his book, uh, he published it. The first book I didn't know, he published back in the early 50s in here, but it was... Uh, sample data in a sense, but relative to uh, communications or something of that nature, circuits. You have to distinguish circuits from the control business, yeah. But he's published many books subsequently. He's published a book on, if I remember correctly, the one on relay control systems. I got a French edition of it. And as recently, I think, subsequently it was published in English, but I got the French edition anyway. And even recently, he's published a couple books. I can't remember what they are, you know. But you could read his papers, for example, when they appeared in a Russian journal, Automatic and Telemechanica, which had been translated in English in as in many libraries as automation and remote control. He published many papers in there. You could sort of follow his progress in that sense of reading his books and papers. So, okay. I consider him as one of the world leaders in the field of automatic control. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how many of that? That four? Four, we're done. <laughs> we're down to, how about a fifth one like Rudy? Rudy, who you want? Rudy Coleman. There you are. You got it right. Some people don't pronounce it Coleman. That's all I have. I want to see what you did. Well, okay. Well, Rudy, I've sort of put in the same category because of his work on the famous Coleman filtering theory, which he essentially first published in, uh, you know, generally available in the ASME transactions back in the uh, 60s, I guess. It was 1960, something yeah, like that. Which is a difficult paper to read for two reasons. First, the theory is not so. It's not so difficult to understand the theory if you just got the background that you can understand it. It's an important point. 
they're calculus books, you see, if you know they've got the background so you can read calculus, you see, that's the same idea here. Least variable kind of theory is what he's got there. And uh, uh, minimum variable theory. The least squares, that's what I was fishing for. Gauss was famous for his work on least squares. The, uh, but it, it, the, the, the printing is in small type and it's hard to read, that makes it difficult between the two. Okay, but it's a famous paper, of course, cited you know, hundreds, thousands of times and so on. And it's been brought in. There are several books you can now buy. I think there's an excellent book written by a Professor Brown, if I remember, maybe with a co author who's down at Iowa State University. Pretty good book on film. And there are other books published earlier around on filtering theory. Uh, but uh, I, so far as I know, in, in a field applied in the field of control, maybe it's found a cons you know, very considerable use in uh, connection with uh, control relative to, to the aerospace. <clears throat> so in the journal of uh, the American Institute of Astronautics and Aeronautics, as it's called now, in their journal, uh, journal of uh, guidance and control, you can find numerous papers in there which give you actual details of the information of problem filtering theory in connection with the kind of papers and developments and projects that are the results of which appear in this journal. That's the place I refer students to if you want to see, read some papers that have actual application of filtering theory. It's been used elsewhere, but I'm not familiar with details of it. Otherwise, filtering theory in the common sense has not been one of my uh, major uh, particular areas of study. I've read the books and I'm familiar with the essential detail, but I haven't other than that. Okay. When I talked to George Axelby uh, a year or so ago, he, in his mind, regarded the IFAC uh, meeting in Moscow in 1960 as kind of a, a watershed in uh, automatic control. Uh, first, because of the papers that were presented, there were a number of really important papers that went there, and also because it, it marked sort of the transition from the frequency domain approach to the time domain approach. They, in his mind, uh, that was a very distinct uh, turn of events for control theory, that they went back to trying to do the analysis using nth order, first order, and first order differential equations, state state model kind of stuff at that point. Do you, do you regard it that way? Well, first I'd use time domain in a different sense. Let's say it was the transition from the old uh, transfer function frequency response concept, okay, mm -hmm. into a revival uh, for use in control <laughs> theory of a, a procedure which was developed at least 100 years earlier, like, for example, you can find it set out in the books uh, written by the, uh, the British mathematician, uh, I told you his name yesterday. Remember? Byerly? How? Was it Byerly? No, know? not Byerly. He was a professor at Harvard. Uh, uh, I don't come to my mind. Anyway, he wrote a series of six volumes on differential equations and subsequently whittled it down into two volumes sort of for classroom use. And it's it's uh, the uh, that idea of replacing an uh, nth order equation by an first order equation you can find there. You know, nothing novel about it. However, the interesting point was that it was sort of first for control purposes introduced in, by the Russians. Okay, and that was the what led to more commonly called state space rather than time domain procedure. You can use time domain in various senses if they use that word. But the state space, remember, that was the one that, the famous state space uh, introduction, which took place about that time. Yeah, because, but it was first developed uh, relative to use and control theory in the USSR and then gradually percolated into the United States maybe in the 60s. Do you regard the the interest in that stuff that developed in the 60s as being linked to the digital computer? No. It was another way of solving differential equations. To, well, to handling it as the nth order, you take n first order. Yeah, but if you... Well, it's a different approach. If you have a different... It had to do with digital computers, if you have specifically. A if you have a differential... If you have a digital computer that can invert matrices of significant size and calculate eigenvalues, that's going to make a difference. Yeah, but I don't think it was done for that particular reason. Because you got to remember, we did develop the digital computers that could do large-scale uh, systems came somewhat later. 
Mm, you know, well, you, I, I want to handle all the chronology because I haven't got a reference at hand. We can check all the dates. But I, I, I don't think it was influenced by that. No. It was the, the idea it was that uh, there are certain advantages, if you uh, theory wise, in one way or the other. Not necessarily the whole business of the digital computer aspect. For looking at the solution of an nth order differential equation as a set of n first order differential equations. And one thing that it leads to is uh, the introduction of the use of matrix theory because then you get a set of equations which are other than first order. So you got n first order and you get an n by n matrix and so on, okay? Well, it's a very compact notation. Yeah, matrix well, it's more theory. than a notation. You got a different branch of mathematics involved, matrix theory, which wasn't very much used. You look at the books Chestnut and Mayer, I don't think you find any matrices in there. You look at Brown and Campbell, you won't find any matrices in there. There's certain advantages connected with matrix in, its, in itself. That are useful. Well, I'll give you another area where matrices are very much used in a sort of a way that ties in control. Th look, in ter look in terms of, uh, of uh, vibration relative to aircraft systems. Now, back in Britain, uh, there were several people that were that working at their uh, whatever that center was, Teddington, I guess that's right. Yeah, the National Physical Laboratory kind of thing. Okay, like with Bureau of Standards here. And uh, there are two individuals. Uh, let's see if I can pull the name out of my memory. Duncan and Connor. Okay, yeah, that worked there, and they wrote a famous book, still in print, on vibration theory. Okay. Uh, in which n first order equations are used, and in connection with this, matrices appears. So look up Duncan and Collar's book, still in print, you can buy it, and probably reprint it over press, I suppose. Uh, and you'll find set out of there, that kind of thing. Okay, so in a sense, vibrating systems, you know, there's a, much, there's a lot of one-to-one -one analog Correspondence between vibrating systems and electric circuits. Okay. Matter of fact, you must remember, surely, that Pupin, who was professor, emigrated from uh, uh, Central Europe, came to the United States, became subsequently professor of physics at Columbia University, and investigated <coughs> the whole business as Heaviside was the first to point out that you can improve the operation of telephone lines over what they were at that time when he started the early ones by increasing the inductance in various ways in the line appropriately, appropriately okay? You get less distortion. And he invented the famous distortionless telephone equations, okay? But anyway, well, he suggested that you could take, instead of using just copper wires, you could wind them with an iron uh, coil sort of around it to increase the inductance, don't you see? And actually there's a kind of uh, wire directly manufactured in a sort of sense known as the Kroop. I remember a Kroop or something like that cable. I think that they did it in Denmark. It's a funny name. So you could increase the inductance. So, you know, it took a while. For this kind of information, he published it all right, and then look up his three collected paper volumes in electromagnetic to trickle down into use in the telephone industry. And as a matter of fact, it was opposed by the equivalent of the chief electrical engineer for the British telephone system, Priest. He opposed it. He said that was preposterous, such. Well, you know. <laughs> He didn't know theory. Heavy side did, you know. Heavy side proved to his satisfaction. Well, subsequently came the idea, how about this in the United States? And you remember the famous case there, okay? That Pupin decided he had a pretty good training in mechanics in here. The analog was something like this. If you take a loaded string and you put beads of metal, heavy metal, at appropriate points and you study the vibrations, it vibrates better with these beads in here than otherwise. So the immediate obvious thing to do was to put in lump inductances on a telephone line and you improve its operation. One to one correspondence. And the basic patent was taken out by Pupin, and he became a fairly wealthy professor by the royalties that came from that patent. And he, he beat Campbell, who was at the equivalent of Long Lines Division of AT&T, uh, to the patent office by a very short interval of time. But the, then he, in turn, leased his patents to Bell Labs.
I mean, well, not Bell Labs, but AT&T, okay? Now, that was one of the three fundamental patents that led to the great growth of AT&T as it is now in the telephone system, because there were lots of competitors in those days. We're talking now the early 1900s. And the fellow he beat was Kent Bell, who was working at the lab, but in the process of then figuring out what's the most appropriate stringing distance between these loading coils, as they were subsequently called, that you put on the line. He discovered they act like filters, and he took out the basic patents on filtering that way, see? So you get the exact kind of analog, if you think of it. Look at Duncan and Collar's work, and then look at state space approach. They're one-to-one -one correspondence in the theory. The equations and so on, okay? So I don't think the digital computer directly entered into it. That wasn't the point. Mm. When, did the, uh, when did the Russians, uh, or how involved did the Russians get in uh, the transfer function theory after World War I? How or involved two, did they get? Well, they developed theory there in the same way we developed here. You've got to keep in mind was that it, uh, Russians are pretty bright people. They got was it going on during the war then? They 70 were million over there, and they got as many good men as we got. Okay? At the same time, corresponding, the populations are pretty much level all the way through it, numbers. So you would say that they started working on the transfer functions uh, in the 40s then? Well, their development was about the same as ours in time. In time, so. Yeah, roughly oh. speaking, that's all I can tell you. Look we at just, their early books. We got a practically every book published on automatic control theory. If they were Russian books, I, uh, were ordered for our, our engineering library, okay? And there's lots of them in the stacks in here and so on. But I ordered, I owned at one time about 500 myself in the Russian language. And when I gave the whole my collection after I retired to the College of Engineering, somehow around the 500 Russian books disappeared. Now, that's an interesting point. Were they thrown out as waste paper because, you know, nobody reads Russian around here? <laughs> anyway, suddenly, <laughs> this whole three of these metal upright things filled with the books of the Russian language disappeared. You can't find a trace of the damn things, okay? So all I'm saying is they developed control theory in a sense as well as we did. Maybe they were ahead of us in some ways, okay? We were ahead in other ways and so, yeah. Well, one thing seems to me apparent is they, they were simultaneously looking at, uh, call it time domain or call it state space analysis. And Stick to state space. Okay. Yeah, it's time domain stuff. But anyway, uh, they were doing both. We, sure. for a long time, were just doing the one. Yeah, that's right. Well, sort of the transition came, uh, you know, with, uh, well, time goes on. You have to keep expanding all the time. So <clears throat> I was trying to remember who might have published the first book uh, in, in the U.S. as a control book with a state speed. I just can't tell you often who did the first one of any consequence. But uh, in the 60s, it started to appear. But you've got to remember that was also sort of stimulated <clears throat> by development in Russia of Pontryagin's maximum principle. But the, that, that sort of uh, stimulated the variational approach, uh, which is sort of the tie-in with the state-space approach business, okay? The, if you look at books on optimal control theory, they're practically all couched in terms of state-space approach, okay, from the very math, because of the mathematics and so on, okay? And Pontryagin, who is a famous mathematician, he only died fairly recently, I think, published this paper, nothing to do with control. Uh, as far as I know, I've looked at the original paper. It's been translated into, uh, there's a book published by Pontryagin and three other authors, authors that have been translated into English, and you can find it in most libraries. <clears throat> he, was a, he was a mathematician, and this was a procedure really in the calculus of variations, in a sense, okay? Oh, and with the variational approach that came in in conjunction with state space, the rise of optimal control theory, then... Uh, there you were. State space, optimal control theory, Pontiagas maximum principle, a tool in there, just like the introduction of Hamiltonian analysis. Yeah. Uh, you know, for example, stop and think about it. Did the Russians have big digital computers at that time, back in the early 60s? I was always told by people that had gone there and their papers written on this, even there was a Turing once to look into the to tie it in with the American Automatic Control Council and IFAC to uh, look to see specifically what the Russians were doing in computers 
I suppose because of the military usefulness of computers back in the 60s. The answer was, well, gee, they don't have much in the way of computers over there. Yeah, but see, I think their motivation for, for that formulation of the control problem stems from the fact that their mathematics people were a lot closer tied to their control people than what might be the case in this country. Why would you say that? <coughs> Why do you say that? I mean, because the, the Russians have always been very strong in the pure mathematics area. Yeah, but well. you have to keep in mind something mm -hmm. here. After all, left shows went to the trouble to, to uh, and Silverman went to the trouble to translate all these books on differential equations. In the left Shets did? And Silverman, I think, too. How many books did he translate? And the answer is you don't know because I don't know if any he translated. He might have done one or two. Well, he was either here as Silverman that did one of them. Who? Oh. Silverman. Well, there's several Silvermans, so I don't know. But, I'm quite sure that one of these guys at Harvard went to the trouble to translate a couple of these books on well, differential equations. I remember Lefschetz was at Princeton for most of his mm. mathematical could career been, after uh, leaving Kansas to go to Princeton. Yeah. Could have been, I think, Silverman. Somebody at Harvard did a lot of work on translating those uh, Russian read? books on differential equations. Do you know what the books are specifically and who the authors are? No. Well, maybe you're just getting, what was that word you used yesterday? Oh, I've, got, oh, I got, I've got one of these books. Oh, you could have been, there were, obviously, there are a lot of books that were translated. I'm not arguing that. But the point I was going to, I was thinking of this. I don't think that there were many people in departments of mathematics, which is taught in universities in Russia, they were interested in the control aspect because of the fact that engineering is taught in separate institutions, as you well know. For example, I've had four Russian professors that were visited you know, with me for the ac an academic year, several years each apart. And they all came from, the first one was a guy that came from Moscow Power Institute, and he's still active over there, as a matter of fact, uh, back probably in the early 1960s or early, late 1950s, I don't remember. So engineering is taught in an entirely different category over there. They're not universities where the mathematicians are. For example, Sipton is not in the university, it's at the Institute of uh, Academy of Sciences in the particular division, and uh, evidently based in Moscow for automatic control. However, there's another point you've got to keep in mind. Mathematics uh, can be used uh, not necessarily only by mathematicians, but you learn mathematics and use it in chemistry, physics, engineering, and all the rest of it. Now, it's, it's, so if you, if you look through, this is the interesting point, look through Aftomatic and Telemechanica. The translation, we got almost a complete file since World War II. But that started back, yeah, well, they only, they only started translating with the Sputnik business and so on. Sputnik business and so on. The, but it, the, the journals start, well, I won't say that journal, but uh, there's another journal which lots of control stuff appears in the way of stability and things like that. And what they called, uh, there's an English Translations Journal, which is a uh, journal of applied mathematics, essentially, is the title. And when it's translated into English, it has a purple cover on it. So we get it in the library here with a big, great big uh, initials P, P, something or other, which is translates into Applied Mathematics and Mechanics. That's what I was fishing for. It's a, the title is Applied Mathematics and Mechanics, yeah. So you find lots of control papers in their relative stability. And the, the interesting cast of these papers is they all, they're, they're, the great majority of them are concerned primarily relative to what I would infer would be connected with their craft. You know, gyroscopic problems, uh, all kinds of stuff. I, not very much, because if you want to know, look for power, you have to look in the Russian journal translated as electricity. I mean, the English word, the Russian word translates as electricity. No. Well, what are your views on uh, on the modern, on the on the latest developments in control, on say adaptive control? How do you view that? Well, I don't have any particular view except to say that uh, there's a number of books been written uh, where they have the title uh, embedded in it, the words adaptive control. There's hundreds of papers, maybe thousands by now. There's lots of people in the academic world that have uh, either co-authored papers or books or both, and it's a big field. Okay? But... Uh, uh, see, there's also, I was trying to remember that Astrum 
it seems to me, it has had a particular interest in uh, adaptive control theory, if I remember correctly. That's one of his areas of interest. He's, if you remember, he's in one of the Scandinavian countries. I could think in a moment which one, but anyway, he's there. Lund. Huh? Lund. Yeah, that's what stuck in my mind, but I'd want to say something like that. And I've corresponded with Astrom for many years. He, is, he speaks, he writes English as well as any American, I guess. But he put it, obviously, he's bilingual or trilingual or so on. And uh, that's one of his interests in here, and he's certainly one of the major figures at the present time, European figures in automatic control in the academic world. Yeah. So, you know, but I've never I'm particularly focused on adaptive control theory. There's a great deal of interest, but I've simply never focused on it. My interest sort of went like this, as I told you yesterday. Basic control theory when it started, then subsequently in the 50s, introducing course of nonlinear control theory, which is one of the first, if not the first course, maybe taught academic-wise for a whole semester devoted to nonlinear control theory, which binds me as part of that. I reviewed everything that had been done in the, in the uh, previous literature. When you say everything, you know it's a pretty wide cast anyway. Uh, and I wrote a summary paper uh, reviewing that. And you know, the, the interesting turn, thing turned out that the strongest components have been done by Russian authors, as a matter of fact. And I, I published this. And uh, where did I publish it? I think I published it. Yeah, I know I did. Now it comes to me. I published it because of my friend Oldenburger. I published it in an ASME transaction show. Yeah. On a copy, I'll mail one down to Georgia for you. It's really a very interesting paper because it recapitulates all of this earlier work up to the time that I had done it. Wrote it. It runs to a number of pages. Well, then the next thing that came along was uh, sample data, as they call it, then discrete data, and subsequently uh, uh, computer control and so on, like Professor Duffy and uh, Bollinger teach at the current time in their, through the use of their book anyway, which has been pretty well uh, adopted. Well, then the next thing, and I can give you the date pretty well, was the fact I wanted to introduce a course in uh, multivariable control theory, multiple inputs, multiple outputs. And the first book, in my opinion, written as a textbook for this, was done about 1975 or 6 by an English author. And uh, it's a publication. I uh, adopted that as a textbook, opened up the course, and we used that for... Uh, Several years. However, uh, just about 1980 or 81, uh, when I was getting very close to the end of my teaching career, there appeared a better book, also written by authors in English, which I consider the best book now available if you want to teach a course in multivariable control theory. And it's fairly recent, 1981 or something like that. Yeah, by three authors, if I remember. I can't remember the author offhand. I didn't have occasion to it. So that was about the last of what I call large scale segments that I particularly. Worked in. But I've had students that did theses and so on relative to, say, model reduction, identification, and all that kind of thing, variational approaches of one kind or another, and so on. But those are big segments basic control theory, nonlinear control theory, sample data, digital control theories. It was called for a while discrete data, if you want to use that. I think that was used in term in one of uh, Kuo's books that he wrote down at the University of Illinois. He wrote a book on digital and uh, yeah, uh, discrete data control theory. Well, I think that one particular. But maybe the best book now that you might want to use for discrete data control theory or is the one written, maybe there are several authors, the one by Franklin and uh, Powell. Is that the co-author there? It's a pretty good book. There's another one written by somebody down at Auburn, if I remember the location. Uh, and so on. anyway, there's about three good books you could take your choice of. Now, they're quite recently written in the last several years, if you really want good up-to-date books in that field. And then multivariable control theory, relatively few books have been pu published specifically for that subject area. And the best book, I think, is that one written by these two or three, whatever they were, about 1980-81. But the first book written earlier was pretty good, too. Had student exercises, had problems in it, illustrative examples, you know, the whole work. Pretty good book for the first book to be used in the subject. <clears throat> Let's see. Why don't we talk about uh, Rufus Oldenberger? Oldenberger is a guy that's, uh, we never did get a chance to interview. What if we had the chance? And uh, so the only way we're going to capture anything about Rufus, I guess, is to get some recollections from the people that knew him, and you knew him pretty well. 
Uh, we were casual friends and, and professional colleagues and so on for a number of years. That's right. You first knew him where at IIT, I guess? Well, you see, when I came to IIT, Rufus uh, was, a, was a, I guess he was a professor, maybe associate professor, but it sticks in my mind, full professor in the Department of Mathematics. He had uh, gotten his PhD at the University of Chicago. He did a thesis under A.A. A. Albert there, who was one of the leading algebras of his day, later became dean of the graduate school. After finishing his degree, he had a postdoc kind of fellowship appointment, which he had to compete for nationally, where he received it and spent his year in Stockholm. And uh, when I knew him, he was single, he was married, and uh, maybe had one child at least. But uh, and he'd married a very attractive uh, young woman who came with a legal background in the sense her father, as I remember, was a lawyer based in either Cleveland or Cincinnati. And as a matter of fact, let me put this in before I forget it. She had a brother, and there's a book called American Geniuses. <laughs> you can find it in the York University shelves. And in this list is her young brother. He's practically at the end of the book because it's sort of arranged chronologically, I think. Uh, and he had a most distinguished career this fall. He, uh, <coughs> he graduated with a bachelor's degree, and he was interested in music, and he studied at Yale, if I remember rightly, with Hindemith, the German composer and player that came to the United States, was probably a professor of music there in that sense. And then he decided that, then he, he had a, a short career as a, con, as a concert pianist. And I heard him play with Eleanor and uh, Rufus uh, in a, uh, a small hall down in Chicago. They invited me to go with him. Yeah. And subsequently he decided, well, he's never going to be really a top flight concert pianist, you see. So he shifted to medicine. So subsequently, he took both a Ph.D. and a uh, M.D. at Harvard and somehow or other in connection with neural kinds of activities. Neuro, I don't want to call him a neuro uh, physician, neuro, I mean physician or otherwise, but anyway, and to my knowledge, he's still up there working, unless he's you know, reached the end of his career by now and so on. Uh, that was one of Eleanor's brothers. There was uh, another one there, but I can't remember exactly what that. She was one of three children in anyway, Cleveland area. In earlier years, after graduation from her university, I don't recall which one, she had been in Paris for a year or two and had worked as a sort of a volunteer sales person and so on at a famous bookshop, Shakespeare's Head, if I remember the name of her. And then she and Rufus got married. So they were, he was a professor at, uh, there, and so we got acquainted. And eventually, uh, it came a situation that Woodward Governor Company uh, got contract for the development of, of governors to be used for fairly high uh, angular velocity uh, uh, what's the word on? For high, high angular velocities and connects with jet engine control. That was the point I was trying to fish for. So the chief engineer, Frank Drake, as I remember his name, thought, thought they needed some analytical help. And the way I was told, anyway, he came to IIT and had a friend there, and this friend suggested that Rufus might be of aid. And Rufus started to consult with him on a per diem basis, I suppose. And eventually, uh, his income was pretty substantial relative to what professors were paid in those days. Okay, I think I started there at 3,200 as associate professor, and worked up almost as to being a full professor at 5,000 <laughs> over a period of six years, five years. So you can see salaries are pretty small. Well, anyway, subsequently, Woodward Governor Company thought that uh, they'd like to employ him full time, or at least for a while. So he joined there, probably on leave from the math department, was arranged with the president of the University of Heald at that time, and went up there and started to do analytical work. And that's when he joined a mechanical engineering-oriented uh, corporation, I suppose. That's when he became involved in the American Society of Mechanical Engineering. Seems logical to me. I guess I can never recall asking him specifically. And they had, at that time, a division, I think, that was called the Regulator Division, see? 
And he obviously became active in the regular division, and I would say subsequently uh, revived, uh, stimulated a sort of, a, you know, a, a division that wasn't too active. And subsequently, he left IIT and uh, stayed full-time with them. And then time went on, he decided like to get back into the academic world. So he was offered this position at Purdue to join the Department of Mechanical Engineering to teach control theory, and to, he formulated the laboratory there, because he gained a lot of laboratories, 10 or 12 or whatever the years where he was a Woodard Governor Company. So he joined them, and he developed this lab. Uh, the lab was developed with the help of grants from industry and otherwise, I suppose. And after several years, uh, he didn't do too much teaching subsequently, and uh, he spent full time on this lab. And he was very active then, in, uh, from the beginning, I suppose, when the American Automatic Control Council was formed. It seems to me I attended the initial meeting where we, down in Dallas, where the discussion led to the formulation of the American Automatic Control Council. Uh, and I was quite active in earlier years in the connection of one of the committees concerned with bibliography. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, at the time of the IFAC meeting, there was a possibility I would prepare a bibliography of all the control literature. You know, I started upon this, and I prepared three of 15 parts. And then they suddenly realized, well, three of 15 parts was already something like 50 pages. What would the whole thing come to, in the sense of pages, and we never get this printed and all that kind of thing. So we never went further <laughs> with that point. It was abandoned. <laughs> okay. But I still have the first three parts of my files. Well, the you know, the reason there was another reason. Subsequently, as you know, the, uh, the literature grew so great. It is now turned into the IEEE or uh, yeah, they they uh, I guess they publish this in connection with IEEE of abstracts and control and computers. Okay, so that's where you look for the control computer abstracts nowadays. That's a very great big thick thing every month itself. Uh, the, so Rufus then, you know, was there for a number of years. He developed cancer of the colon and, and died. But he did a lot of traveling in connection with giving lectures and so on under various sponsorships. And, so. and his wife subsequently remarried and was there at this time, a uh, professor in the aeronautical engineering department there. And, he retired, and I, they're still here. I communicate still by Christmas cards with Eleanor. Yeah. But I was trying to remember the name of the man who then subsequently took over the laboratory, chemical engineering background, became a very active figure in uh, auto American Automatic Control Council, was a president one year. <laughs> I remembered the name last night. Well, I was lying in bed, it came to me. And it's now slipped my mind again. Okay, <laughs> but he—you'd he, not recognize his name immediately if you heard it. He was—he's a former member of the American uh, president of American Automatic Control. I think Rufus might have been too one time. I can't—I I can't say for certain, but I believe he might have been a president one year because he could travel with this kind of an operation he had. You see, yeah, he did like to travel. He was in Russia, and, you know, all the other meetings around the world where I think was held. Uh, maybe the name will come to my mind while I sit here again. Uh, but, but he shifted the emphasis. He was interested in the stimulation of the use of digital computers in connection with chemical process control, see? And of course that reminds me, and so they had special courses and lectures and so on there, and he did a lot of raising money from industry and that kind of thing. He's, I think he's not retired. But uh, reminds me of Tom Stout. Uh, who, do you know Tom Stout? Mm -mm. Well, Tom Stout was a bulwark in the early days of uh, American uh, Automatic Control Conference, too. Well, let's see. His father was a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Michigan. And his father wrote a book on, uh, on electrical and magnetic measurements, uh, maybe just electrical, but anyway, say electrical and magnetic measurements, because you, you have permeameters and things like that, too which I used once in my course in here, Marshall's book, Stout's book. Well, anyway, Tom got a Ph.D. degree, and then if I remember correctly, I'd have to check on this. Uh, he was at Uni Washington uh, University in Seattle for a number of years, okay? If I remember correctly, okay. And then subsequently, he went into a business 
and I think the title of the business is something like Prof Profit Maddox. Get the idea? Making making profits. And what they specialized in was the trying to approach the chemical engineering industries in here to uh, in connection with digital computer control relative to chemical, or they, or they, as they call it, process manufacturing uh, control. But process control primarily means uh, relative to chemical engineering industries. Yeah. Now, Tom is still is retired, but still active. And occasionally, we uh, communicate, and at the present time, one of his interests that I wrote him about was that in California, they were trying to get, there's been some pressures out there to, uh, in a sense, to, to require, if you practice control one way or the other, you got to have a license. Well, you know, that opens up. <clears throat> so he's written a couple of papers on that, and in connection with my work, uh, interest in the Wisconsin Society of Professional Engineers and so on, I've written him for copies of these papers and other things. So we've had a correspondence the last year or two. But he's a well-known figure, particularly. In the earlier days, he's like I am. I must be in the 70s, you see. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm 81 and a half. No. How much time we got left in this tape? Eight minutes. Eight minutes? Yeah. All right, let's just stop this one. Yeah.